Hello neighbor, I'm Robert Burns and do you realize it's been over 30 days since our last feature was brought to you but who could have imagined uh, the catastrophic event that took place shortly after our, loss, our last video uh, and that being the massive flood that was endured by the South Louisiana area and that's going to be our focus for our topic this evening which is the Comet River Diversion Canal and the boondoggle that it has been for uh, taxpayers who reside within a district that has been being taxed to fund that particular project and yet at the same time the bonanza of cash that it has been uh, for attorney Larry S. Bankston along with a few others. Now, brief background on the Comet River Diversion Canal. Uh, it was conceptually drawn up uh, after the massive flooding of 1983 and the premise behind the Diversion Canal would be to sort of serve as a pressure relief valve. Uh, it would take uh, water away from the Comet River, uh, divert it over toward uh, the Mississippi River and drain directly into it, thereby dropping uh, the water levels along the Comet and thereby alleviating some of the pressure uh, that presently goes down on the Amid out to Port Vincent uh, and areas, uh, French settlement areas like that. Uh, that's the premise behind it. Uh, and uh, the original cost of the Comet River Diversion Canal was estimated to be $120 million. $120 million. Uh, the, the current estimate of uh, constructing the canal is $220 million. Uh, but of that $120 million back way back when, when it was first drawn up, how are they going to go about uh, financing uh, the construction of this diversion canal? Well, uh, $84 million out of the $120 million, and we'll put these numbers up on the screen for you, uh, $84 million uh, of the funding was to come from the feds by way of the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, the state of Louisiana was to place up another $30 million, and the final $6 million, which I'm going to consider the tail wagging the dog here, uh, was to be provided by what I just mentioned to you, a very small tax imposed upon uh, those that reside within the district that would be benefited by the Comet River Diversion Canal, and that amount was $6 million. So we have 120 million. It's comprised of 80 million from the feds, 30 million, I'm sorry, 84 million from the feds, 30 million from the state, and 6 million uh, from that little local taxing district. Now, as many of you have observed, Donald Trump will frequently say that, hey, we don't negotiate the best deals, particularly when he references his trade. Uh, and I would submit that this would be an example of bad deal negotiation because those local taxpayers, there was no ability for them to force either the feds or the state's hand on ponying up their share. Nevertheless, as anyone knows, once you've approved a property tax, you're going to get hit with it, okay? Uh, and you're going to pay it whether you want to or not. And what happened was uh, there was no funding transpiring. Again, bad deal negotiation. Uh, by either the uh, federal or the state authorities to fund this project, but yet they were co continuing to collect uh, from the local district uh, taxpayers within, who resided within this uh, project. And uh, what that led to is uh, a number of folk who were paying the tax uh, became quite disgruntled, and so in March of 2014, they filed a class action lawsuit uh, to recover uh, the overage. You know, remember, it was supposed to be capped at $6 million. That's what they were contending. Uh, and and, and uh, all of that excess overage, which through 2013, bear in mind this lawsuit, and I'm going to call it the gravy train lawsuit, okay? You'll see why in a moment. Uh, the, the gravy train lawsuit was filed uh, because uh, they had already, through 2013, they had collected... 25 million dollars to fund this thing. Now, strictly the local folk now, remember it was supposed to be capped at 6 million. That's what was originally said. 
but the tax was approved in the year 2000. It had been being collected, and through the year 2013, there had been a grand total of $25 million collected just by the local taxpayers, okay? So they filed a class action lawsuit uh, to recover the 19 million that they were alleging had been paid in excess of what they were told they would have to be on the hook for on this. And the trial lasted about two weeks. It took place in uh, Judge Wilson Fields courtroom. There was a jury uh, that heard the case. Uh, the attorneys who represented the class members who filed suit on, or the members who filed suit on behalf of the entire class. Uh, that team was led by a lady named Donna Grodner. Uh, she was assisted by a, an attorney named Joel Porter and also Ashley Earl and Steve Irving. Those were your four primary attorneys uh, who presented the class action lawsuit case. Now, what all did they show during the two-week trial? And we're going to give you a link so that you can see a recap of what all took place during that two-week trial. Uh, it, it, it's a short, will take you maybe four or five minutes to read. Uh, but I'm going to also just give you some of the highlights uh, because like I said, they called it the, I'm going to call it the gravy train lawsuit, okay? What was some of the evidence that they put on uh, to suggest that the reality of this Comete River Diversion Canal is nothing but a gravy train uh, for Mr. Bankston and some other folk uh, that, that have benefited hugely from the formation of what, an entity called the Amy River Basin Commission, all right? The Amy River Basin Commission. Its sole function was to shepherd uh, the going, the, 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 the uh, fruition, the coming about of this Comet River Diversion Canal. Uh, of course, you've got board members, and of course, you're going to have to have an executive director. Now, that'll take us to, to what, some of the points that they made. Uh, and Donna Grodner put up most of these uh, material, but and I, it's very difficult to pronounce uh, the executive director's name, and, and I'm going to just use his first name, not out of disrespect, but even it is a little difficult, me and I, difficult for me, and I hope I'm close, and I'm going to call it Dietmar. I hope I'm close. Uh, we're going to give you a, uh, th th they had put up, uh, that Mr. Dietmar's salary was $93,000 uh, and th there was a contention that that was excessive uh, and we'll give you a link to the current salaries uh, of both of the two uh, employees that are employed permanently. The other employee who is the basically the executive assistant is a young lady named Tony Guitro. Uh, she also serves as the mayor of French Settlement. Now. French Settlement is really just a village, and so uh, we're not talking about a real high-paying job in being the mayor of French Settlement. In fact, it was stated that it only the salary is only $500 a month. So she serves as the executive assistant, if you will, and the executive director being uh, Mr. Dietmar, hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly, his salary being $93,000 a year, uh, Steve Irving specifically questioned Miss Guitro on the stand about whether or not uh, her $38,000 salary may be a tad high. He even pointed out that uh, his contention of that regard, uh, he, he buttressed by saying that she had no more than a high school education. Uh, I'll just say this. Uh, if, 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 if Mr. Irving thought that the 38000 uh was high, and I'm not going to say whether it was or wasn't, I will tell you there were, uh, the jury was dominated by females, and I think perhaps his line of questioning may have alienated them somewhat. Uh, at least that was some indication that was gotten after the trial was over. But at any rate, I'm going to give you a link. If he thought the 38000 was high, her present salary is 44000 okay? Uh, so if he thought it was high at 38, uh, he probably thinks it's even more so now at, at 44. And I'm just going to say that you, you, we're talking about just the start because what a lot of people don't realize, and I'm trying to make this point with the Jay Darden piece that we did, uh, is that you've also got a long-term impact uh, in terms of retirement benefits. 
Uh, and we'll provide you with links because I'm going to provide you with the most recent documents from the Legislative Auditor's Office uh, for their audit. Now that ends on June 30th, 2015, and I'm just giving you the key pages. Uh, you will see that in addition, and by the way, I think Mr. I think Mr. Deaton Mars salary continues to be 93 but it may be 101 in fact I think it I think it may be 101 uh, but at any rate there is a 37 percent contribution needed to fund his retirement same for Miss Guitro uh, so when you add that in uh, <laughs> therein lies the contention of a gravy train because now you're gonna have full retirement benefits uh, from this whole agency being set up. Now there are other expenses such as the I think the board meets every month. They don't they don't they don't pay a lot uh, you know for for those board meetings but but the, 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 the central contention was that uh, hey uh, you know a lot of folk getting pretty nice money here uh, and 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 that's where our taxes have been going and not to fund the six million that we were told uh, that we would be responsible for. Now on the legislative auditor's report you'll see that five hundred and thirty six thousand dollars is what's a year is what's budgeted for quote general government. <laughs> so that 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 kind of constituted uh, the the uh, excuse me uh, the contention that the gravy team was taking place. I mentioned to you that there had been twenty five million dollars collected uh, by the Amit River Basin Commission taxing, well, the, 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 the district in which this uh, project was to be financed. They had collected 25 million dollars through the year 2013. Now the tax ran for 10 years from 2000 until 2010. Uh, however, uh, there was a proposal for a renewal uh, and actually the millage dropped very slightly from 3 mils to 2.6 mils uh, because of increased property valuations and whatnot. Uh, but at any rate, you'll see on the Legislative Auditor's link that it is generating $2.7 million a year. All right, now that tax has been renewed through the year 2020. Uh, and so if you take the $25 million that had already been collected through the year 2013 and then you project, project on out another 2.7 million dollars a year through the year 2020 these little local taxpayers who were told that uh, okay six million dollars is going to be your contribution to this project by my computations and I am an inactive CPA and I, I think they're going to be pretty accurate uh, they will have paid forty-four million dollars. All right, forty-four million dollars on a project that they were told that hey, your share is only going to be six million. All right, that's thirty-seven percent of the original cost of the project. That's forty-four million dollars represents thirty-seven percent of the original cost of the 120 million dollar project. Now like I said, but because everything is dragged on now and we're going to get to that in just one second, uh, you know the cost now is way more than 120 million dollars, it's now 220 million dollars. Um, and so who all has benefited from this? Well that was the contention in, in their lawsuit. Mentioned Mr. Dietmar, whether it be 93 or 101, well I have the accurate figure up there for you. Uh, the 37 percent retirement contributions. Ms. Guitro, who I know was 38 at the time of the trial, latest le legislative auditor's report uh, shows 44. Again, you've got retirement contributions for her. And let's not forget convicted felon Larry S. Bankston. All right, now, I made public records request. That's one of the reasons that we have so such lengthy periods between videos. I like to give as much detail as I can. Uh, I asked for all of his billings in the two years leading up to that trial. Uh, it was a total of 755 pages. Going to give you direct links to those 755 pages. Now I had to break it down 
into 50 pages each because otherwise it was going to take you too long uh, to download all of Mr. Bankston's billings. But I'm going to encourage, now Mr. Bankston doesn't like me making public records requests. That, and I'll just tell you that, uh, you know, uh, very frequently when I do so, he will redact, uh, in my opinion, too much. Uh, I had to threaten to literally sue the uh, LALB once when he gave me his invoices right off the bat. Everything was redacted. Only going to give me the numbers of what he charged. So you're going to see some redacting in there, but I'm going to welcome you to just go through it. You know, you paid for all this. Uh, you may see a few seminars. Well, and you're actually going to see uh, him reviewing uh, an ethics complaint entailing Miss Grodner. Now, I don't know the specifics of what that entailed, but I do know he billed uh, handsomely for reviewing uh, this complaint against Miss Grodner. Don't know even know who lodged the complaint, uh, but you know, obviously, I guess there may be some bickering back and forth about uh, attorneys and their behavior. Uh, but at any rate, the taxpayers, as, as, as you're driving along and see all of the uh, debris that's piled up, maybe you can take some comfort from the fact that uh, Mr. Bankston uh, would, would uh, you know, have these massive billings uh, that, that you have funded. And I do want to say one thing. I'm not going to make a statement about whether Ms. Guitro is overpaid, as, as, as certainly was contended by uh, the plaintiffs. Uh, in the lawsuit, but I will say this much, all right, uh, you know, you probably need some political connections to get this type of job. Like I said, she is the mayor of French Settlement. Uh, and I will say this, uh, if, if it is a part-time job or doesn't require, uh, you know, a full 40 hours or whatnot, that would not come as a shock to me. Uh, and certainly Mr. Bankston uh, would not be the one who would, you know, uh, be the one to cramp down on this because I'm going to tell you right now in the LALB uh, the executive director Sandy Edmonds was committing and I quote blatant payroll fraud okay and Mr. Bankston comes in and you know I reported that it's a well known fact now and James D. Buddy Caldwell's response was to bring Mr. Bankston in uh, to pursue my auction license over that, okay? Uh, so you're gonna have to forgive me if I'm not real comfortable with Larry S. Bankston uh, being the one who uh, might have a responsibility. If there is uh, any impropriety going on over there, I have zero confidence in him from firsthand experience uh, to do anything about it. Again, I do not know. Uh, I just don't know anything about the operations, the internal operations of that board. I do know about the internal operations of the LALB, and I do know how it was handled when I reported the payroll fraud going over there. And, you know, uh, we have Mr. John Bell Honor Code Edwards, uh, you know, who has now selected Mr. Bankston uh, to also uh, be the legal counsel for the Louisiana Contractors Board. And we'll discuss that in just a moment because we've got a brand new website that we're going to use to track those videos of those meetings. But, all right, so we get into the trial. Joel Porter did the opening arguments, and he did a whale of a job. Uh, he said the taxpayers had been bamboozled. Uh, he said they'd been hoodwinked. Uh, he said there'd been taxation by misrepresentation. Uh, I guess uh, maybe Mr. Porter may be viewed as kind of the Johnny Cochran of, of that plaintiff's team, and he did a fantastic job. Uh, he's very captivating, a very, he's also a preacher, a uh, very dynamic public speaker, and, and he had captivated uh, their attention. Uh, Ms. Grodner got up and gave some more supporting detail in that she said that neither President Obama nor then Governor Jindal had appropriated one dime during their entire tenure in office toward this project. Let me repeat that. She made it a point to say that neither President Obama nor Bobby, she, she said this is one time they're, they're on the same page. They didn't appropriate not one dime during their tenure in office uh, for the funding of this Comete River Diversion Canal. Uh, she also pointed out that there had not been any federal appropriation for funding the canal since the year 2006. Uh, she also contended that Mr. Dietmar uh, had written checks for $800,000 to the Department of Transportation and Development when he had no such authorization to do so by the board. Uh, she also demonstrated 
that the Amy River Basin Commission was experiencing severe cash flow difficulties and that they had pledged the, the future taxes of the district had been pledged to procure a $3.6 million loan uh, from Sabine Bank in order to keep the Amy River Basin Commission on, her words, life support. All right. Uh, she also pointed out that the state had only appropriated $200,000 in total for this Comet River Diversion Canal, and even that was over a decade prior to the trial, and that the only other appropriation was a direct appropriation for $150,000 uh, to install a, a water a, a gauge for measuring the depth. I don't remember where, whether it was Port Vincent or, or, uh, or otherwise, French Settlement, I don't remember where the gauge was installed, but the point is that's it. Uh, also, and, and again, we'll have the detail link for you to, to, to read some of the witnesses who were put on the stand. The uh, Army Corps of Engineers was placed on the stand, a gentleman from the Army Corps of Engineers, and he did say that the Army Corps of Engineers had, had, was making a determination that it was quite likely that the cost of constructing the canal was going to exceed the benefits and therefore there very well may be their serious consideration being given uh, to what is called a termination for convenience uh, as opposed to a termination for cause. Uh, and so uh, basically Steve Irwing uh, in giving a presentation before the, the um, jury uh, had questioned witnesses about uh, had there been some deception you know, the advocate, when he came around time to 2010 to renew this tax, they went, oh, oh, you've got to approve the tax, you know, and, and, and his contention was that somebody had an obligation to reveal all of the things that Ms. Grodner pointed out in the trial, that, hey, this thing is on life support, this thing is in trouble, uh, maybe you ought to factor that in on the renewal vote that you cast in 2010. Uh, that gives you the crux of what was presented. Uh, the result was eight to one. There was only one juror who sided with the plaintiffs. Uh, and as I said, uh, Larry Bankston, and we're giving you the pages uh, for uh, his uh, billings. They are, ma they are massive, 755 pages. But bear in mind, we're talking about a trial. So he's going to have to do quite a bit of work uh, here, and of course, uh, you know, he, there's considerable billings in that regard. You'll see some other items. I'm just going to make it available for you to peruse and see. But my point is that uh, here you have a convicted felon uh, who, while everybody else out there having to deal with debris in their yard, you've got a past convicted felon that no doubt had political connections to, to get this position, uh, who's able to bill nicely. Uh, Mr. Dietmar praised Mr. Bankston during a break. He said, may I assume you're good friends with Mr. Bankston? And I, I told him, no, that wouldn't quite be an accurate characterization. Uh, and he said, oh, well, that's most unfortunate, Mr. Bankston. He's a tremendous man, you know. And I said, well, that's one person's opinion. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Mr. Bankston, as I said, has now been named legal counsel for the contractors board. So in addition to all these billings that he's been able to make for the Amit River Basin Commission, now if there are homeowners that uh, have problems with their contractor, uh, they're going to file complaints with the uh, contractors board and uh, Mr. Bankston will have some role apparently in, uh, in uh, this whole process. And the executive director the Hayride did an outstanding piece on Mr. Banks, and we're going to give you a direct link to that Hayride article. Uh, and clearly, they have some concerns. Attorney General Jeff Landry has some concerns about Mr. Bankston in this position. Uh, Landry would not recommend Bankston, nevertheless. John Bell, Honor Code, Edwards, out of clear obligations that he has made, uh, you know, he sees no problem with it. I see a huge problem with it. Uh, I'm telling you right now, when I reported that payroll fraud, Mr. Bankston went to the wall to get my auction license revoked, okay? That doesn't give me a real warm and fuzzy feeling. So as a result, and we're going to put the URL on the screen right now, we will, Sound Off Louisiana will be videotaping the residential uh, contracting board. They have two. 
uh, subcommittees, residential and commercial. We're going to figure commercial outlets are big boys and probably can take care of themselves and have the resources to, to uh, uh, procure legal action. In sharp contrast, uh, your, your, your homeowner out there, uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and videotape going forward beginning with the September 14th meeting. That's their next residential uh, contractor board meeting. We're going to videotape these things in their entirety. Uh, I can tell you that the videotaping of the auctioneer's licensing board has brought forth some very interesting items. I figure the same may be the case with this uh, contractor's board. The URL at which you can see these videos, I'm giving you the announcement right now uh, that they will be coming out. The URL at which you can view these videos is www.lacontractorboard.com. That's LA contractorboard.com so we're going to be keeping close tabs on Mr. Bankston and uh, and uh, also of, of uh, Honor Code Edwards' appointment to him in this role especially since the executive director has said hey we have the utmost of confidence in Mr. Bankston's uh, integrity and character and I'm glad you've said that because that makes one of us uh, so we will be providing that uh, again it's been 30 something days we've got several features that we're working on, uh, but I, I do take a leisurely pace, as you can see, by getting 755 pages of Mr. Bankston's billings uh, invoices. So uh, we look forward to bringing you the next episode. I want to wish everyone who is having to recover from the flood devastation, uh, I, I want to extend my deepest, um, you know, uh, heartfelt uh, condolences that this transpired in your life. And we're just going to try to do everything we can to make sure that you're not further um, vic victimized or go through more grief. Um, and that's the reason we're going to provide transparency for the contractor's board. Uh, and it's my sincere hope that you'll be back on your feet. Uh, I know this is, this is a period of devastation for, for an awful lot of folk. And, um, but I do know that Louisiana is a resilient group. Uh, we always have been, and obviously the recovery efforts began, and, and uh, I'm believing that, that we'll have our citizens back uh, as they were before this unfortunate flood hit. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to view this video, and we look forward to bringing you the videos of the Residential Contractors Board, and the URL to view them at is www.lacontractorboard.com. Thank you so much.